Good morning. Welcome, leaders. We are so glad that you are here in the sanctuary or if you're at home. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I, um, I would like to encourage those of you who are at home to grab your Christ candle and light it as we light the Christ candle here in the sanctuary. We light the Christ candle to remind us that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. Again, welcome. We are so glad that you are here. Um, just to let you know, our senior minister, Reverend Corey Britt, has been on vacation this week. It is my understanding that he will be in the office tomorrow if you need to be in touch with him. I also want you to know that Chuck Hardy, who is the chair of our staff parish relations committee here at St. Peter's, will be participating in the service. He will be leading all of us in the affirmation of faith, and he will be sharing a pastoral prayer and leading in the Lord's Prayer. Thank you so much, Chuck. Um, I was asked at the first service to announce that if you would like to get one of the vaccines, and you have not, there are some available um, through Midway Medical. I believe that's in Wellington. Or if you know of someone who would like to get the vaccine, and for whatever reason has not gotten it yet, um, please share that word with them. My last announcement is that we are planning a Next Steps class for Sunday, August the 15th at 12.30 p.m. And this is an opportunity if you're a longtime church member or if you're someone who has just begun attending St. Peter's during the pandemic, you will have an opportunity to be in a, a meeting or conversation with Corey Britt, and he will be sharing um, about himself and, and a lot about St. Peter's. If you are interested in membership, that will be session one. Session two and session three will be on August the 22nd and August the 29th. I just ask that you let me know if you're interested so we can adequately prepare prepare for you. I think that's all the announcements. Thank you. Would you stand and join me this morning's call to worship? This is the day that you have made, Lord. Help us to rejoice in it and be glad. Remind us of the privileges we enjoy as your people to come to you in these moments to confess our sins, to receive forgiveness and give it, to pray and sing and listen, to renew our fainting spirits, to rest in all your promises. Open our eyes to see you, Lord. Open our ears to hear your word. Visit us through your Holy Spirit and to help us celebrate our faith. Amen. Now, there's a lot of great songs in our hymnal. Some of them we sing multiple times in the year. Some of them we sing just during a season. And this past week, I realized today is the 25th of the month. The 25th. You know what happens in five months? And yes, this is July, so we're going to do that in July. Brian, get us started, would you please?
affirmation of faith this morning is the modern affirmation. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. You may be seated. Each week, Corey asked us to consider three questions. Who are you calling me to be? Where are you calling me to go? And what are you calling me to give? In regards to that last question, what are you calling me to give? I want to first say thank you so much to all of you for the gifts that you have sent to St. Peter's during the pandemic. I know some families have experienced some hardship. Some have experienced um, a, a great time financially. It's been very much a, whip, a mix, as it has been all across our country. But those of you who have been able to give, Again, thank you so much. We try to be good stewards of the money that you give to this church. And we try to keep you um, appraised of the things that we're doing with your money. Today we have a video that um, features the children's choir. Jen Morgan leads that, and they got started in early February. I think it's amazing how well the children have learned their music in such a short period of time. So enjoy this video.
Thank you so much, Jen. In terms of ways that you can give, um, you can always send your check to the church. I believe our address is on the wall. It is. Um, we also have boxes in our hallway that um, are on the wall. You can put checks or cash in there. Um, we also provide the convenience of Venmo and PayPal, or you can even ask your bank to send your check. So again, thank you for your generosity. As we come to our time of prayer, I invite you to open your hymnal number 365, one of the great hymns of the church. We're going to be singing verses 1 and 4 of Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Please remain seated. Good morning. Before we get into prayer time, I do have a little announcement. With our pastor Corey Brut on vacation, we've taken this opportunity to let you in on a little secret. Our next scheduled fellowship Sunday is August the 14th. That just also happens to be Corey Brut's birthday. Historically, in the past, when the pastor had a birthday, we'd put a card in the back and everybody signed it as they came to worship and we put some money in and we collected up a little money. With the ongoing pandemic, we didn't feel that was the wise thing to do this year. So we've come up with a new plan. We're going to put two decorated boxes in the narthex right inside the front door. One will be marked cards, the other will be marked gifts. We invite anyone who would like to participate to get him a birthday card, sign it, and drop it in the card box. Please do not put any gifts in the cards. Then if you have a gift of either cash, a check, or 
I don't know his favorite restaurant. Maybe you do or, or someplace else. You like to put a gift card in there. You're welcome to drop that in the gift box. Again, please do not put any gifts in the cards. The idea is that the monetary contribution comes from the membership as a whole and not from individual members, okay? Um, if you're watching at home and wondering how to participate, quite simply just mail your cards or, and your gifts to the church office and our very efficient secretary will take care of making sure they get in the right place. We would ask you to mail them separately, the signed cards and the gifts, and we thank you for that. The checks should be made out to the church and they will be converted to the cash. We'll have those boxes in place the Sunday before the 14th, which is the 8th, and also on Sunday the 14th, after which, of course, after the services, we'll be able to present them to him at the fellowship time. So thank you for your help with that. As far as prayer concerns, we've asked, been asked to pray for, pray for the Bobby Bowden family as a tough, fine Christian man faces a terminal illness diagnosis, and uh, it's a difficult time for his family. Bobby says he's ready, okay? And uh, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today to honor, praise, and worship you for who you are. Thank you for this lovely sanctuary in which we gather in your name. We lift up our senior pastor on vacation, pray for his safety and a great time of rest, relaxation, and rejuvenation. Please be with Pastor Rachel as she brings the morning message and help each of us to worship today in spirit and in truth. We ask your blessings on the people of our neighboring island in Cuba who are suffering under a repressive government that has failed to meet their most basic demands as a desperately demonstrate, please keep them safe from your reprisals. As we leave at the close of the service today, help us as we spoke in the affirmation early to leave to serve the people we encounter following the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at this time, please join me in reverently praying the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. On June 1st, 1965, a tiny 13 and a half foot sailboat left Falmouth, Massachusetts for Falmouth, Cornwall, England. At the time, this was the shortest boat to cross the Atlantic. In fact, the boat was so small that its owner, Robert Manry, named it Tinkerbell. It is little. Truth be told, Mr. Manry was afraid, but not of the ocean. He was afraid of all the people who would try to talk him out of the trip. 
Therefore, he only took a few relatives and his wife, Virginia. She was his greatest supporter and encourager. The trip was anything but pleasant. He spent many sleepless nights trying to cross the shipping lanes without getting run over or sinking. Weeks at sea caused his food to become tasteless. Loneliness caused him to have hallucinations, and his rudder broke three times. Storms swept him overboard, and if it hadn't been for the rope around his waist, he would never have made it back on board. Finally, on August 17th, after 78 days at sea, he sailed into England. During his many nights at sea, he had fantasized about what he would do when he got to England. He planned to check into a hotel and eat dinner alone. The next morning, he would call the Associated Press and see if they were interested in his story. But word of his approach had spread. To his amazement, 300 boats with horns blasting escorted the Tinkerbell into port. 40,000 people stood screaming and cheering him to shore. Robert Manry had become an overnight hero, but he couldn't have done it alone. Waiting on the dock was an even greater hero, his wife, Virginia. She had refused to be critical of his dream. She had refused to be negative about the trip. In fact, she gave him constant encouragement, which helped him to pursue and realize his dream. The world needs more people like Virginia Manry. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be in worship today. I thank you for your presence with us. I ask that you open our hearts to hear whatever it is you want to say to us. I ask that you help us grow in our understanding of the importance of encouragement. We pray these things in your name. Amen. As you probably know, names are very significant in the Bible. Often they are rich with symbolism and they tell a story about the person. An Old Testament example would be Abram. He received a new name, Abraham, when, he, when God told him he would be the father of many nations. A New Testament example would be Simon. Jesus changed his name to Peter, which meant rock. Our first scripture introduces us to a man who was mentioned 29 times in the New Testament book of Acts. He, too, had a second name. Acts chapter 4, verses 36 and 37. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means sons of, son of encouragement. He sold a field that, he belong, that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. The scripture tells us the man's name was Joseph, but he was nicknamed Bar Barnabas, B A R meant son of, and N-A-B-A-S meant encouragement. So Barnabas was known as the son of encouragement. We also know he was a Levite of the priestly tribe of Israel. He was from Cyprus, which enabled him to be a bridge between the Jews and the Gentiles in the church. And he sold a field and gave the money to the disciples, which was an indication of his commitment to the church in Jerusalem. If you studied Acts, you know that Barnabas was drawn to people who needed encouragement. He could see the potential in them when others could not. 
He was willing to give them a second chance. He was generous in extending grace. My favorite example was when Saul, better known as Paul, arrived in Jerusalem for the first time after his conversion. The believers in the city were scared of Paul, and rightly so. Paul was an educated and religious man, a Pharisee who had seen Christianity as a threat to Judaism. His mission was to persecute Christians. He had sent some to prison while others were killed. It was difficult for the believers to even imagine that Paul had changed. Only, only Barnabas was willing to risk his life to meet with Paul. Acts chapter 9, verses 26 to 28. When he, he saw Paul, had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and described for them how the road he had uh, that on the road he had seen the Lord who had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus so he Paul went in and out among them in Jerusalem speaking boldly in the name of the Lord these verses show that Barnabas extended the hand of friendship to Paul he acted as a sponsor or an advocate for Paul, and he introduced Paul to the believers in Jerusalem. Barnabas spoke of Paul's conversion experience, and he believed it was genuine. Several years later, and about 300 miles away, the good news of Jesus Christ was being shared with the Gentiles in Antioch. Some in the Jerusalem church were suspicious. Could someone become a Christian without being Jewish? Barnabas was sent to check out the situation. Acts chapter 11, verses 22 to 24. News of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced, and he exhorted, encouraged them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast devotion. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great number were brought to the Lord. Barnabas was the perfect person to send to the Antioch church. He could see that God was doing good things through the people, and he was filled with joy. He exhorted, he encouraged the believers to remain faithful. In the final scripture, we learn that Paul and Barnabas partnered together for their first missionary journey. They took the young man, John Mark, as their assistant. Acts 15, verses 36 to 40. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return and visit the believers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take with them John, call Mark, but Paul decided not to take with them one who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not accompanied them in the work. The disagreement became so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and set out, the believers commending him to the grace of the Lord. Unfortunately, John Mark deserted the group during that first missionary journey, and Paul was aggravated with him. Always the encourager, Barnabas spoke on behalf of John Mark asking that he be allowed to go on the second missionary journey. But Paul would have none of it. So he and Barnabas parted ways. Paul traveled with Silas and Bar Barnabas traveled with John Mark. 
I'm sure Barnabas used that time to mentor John Mark because it's evident that John Mark learned from his mistakes, grew in his faith, and eventually became a close friend with Paul. So what does this mean for all of us? Regardless of our age or stage in life, we all need encouragement at one time or another. We are indeed blessed if we have persons in our lives who know when and how to extend encouragement. I am so grateful to those who have encouraged me through the years, many of you. And I'd like to mention one that goes back to my early ministry. During the summer following my junior year in college, I worked at Look Up Lodge and Camp. Look Up was and is a non-denominational ret Christian retreat center and camp in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. One night, late in the summer, I felt that God was calling me to full-time ministry. It wasn't a mountaintop experience. In fact, it scared me. I didn't know what to do next, and the future was very uncertain. When I got back to college, Max Rice, the owner and director of Lookup, called me. He said that he believed in my call to ministry, and he said that he would hire me when I graduated until I knew what I was to do long term. I would serve if I accepted the position as a liaison between Lookup and churches in the area. I did not accept the position at Lookup, but I will never, ever forget the kindness, the thoughtfulness, and the encouragement of Mr. Rice. He helped confirm my call to ministry. This afternoon, or sometime this week, I hope you will think of those who have encouraged you. Write a note, send a text, or call and thank one of them for blessing your life. In addition to receiving encouragement, we should be ready to give it. 1 Thessalonians says, Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other. Encouragement comes in many forms. I wonder if the good news of Jesus Christ would have spread as rapidly and as far if Barnabas had not seen potential in the new Christian, Saul, also known as Paul. I wonder if the church at Antioch, with its mix of Jewish and Gentile believers, would have continued to function well without the encouraging words of Barnabas. He told them, remain strong, remain faithful. I wonder if John Mark would have had the maturity to write the Gospel of Mark if Barnabas had not chosen to invest time in him. Yes, that's the person who wrote Mark. Children need encouragement just as adults do. Please watch this video, and would somebody get the lights and turn them down, please? I have a lot of memories from when I was a child. One that's always stuck out to me, though, was when I was about 10 years old, and I was in school, and I struggled. And I, I didn't struggle with English, math, or science. I struggled holding still. And I would try to listen and focus and process ideas, but I couldn't help myself. And to be honest, I would sit there, and then I would just start tapping. And the students in the class would look at me, and they'd say, hey, stop tapping. A lot of the time, I didn't even realize I was doing it. And then eventually even the teachers got after me and they would yell at me and they'd say, Clint, you have to stop tapping. It got so bad that I got sent to the principal's office for tapping. And he said to me, okay, maybe when you go back to class, just try sitting on your hands. And so I did. I went back to class and when I felt myself starting to tap, I just, I did this. I sat on my hands and that worked for about five seconds. One time I was tapping in class and my teacher, Mr. Jensen, he looked at me and he yelled. And he said, Clint, stay after class. And I thought to myself, this is it, I am done. Now I've always been the type of person that believes that a single moment in time can change a person's life. And this was one of those moments for me and I will never forget it. And so I was sitting there with Mr. Jensen and an empty classroom. 
And he walked past me and he sat next to his desk and he said, Clint, come here, I want to talk to you. And as he looked me right in the eye, he said, now I need you to know something, you're not in trouble. But I do have just one question that I have to ask you. And he asked, he said, have you ever thought about playing the drums? And in that moment, Mr. Jensen, he leaned back and he opened the top drawer of his desk. And he reached in and he pulled out my very first pair of drumsticks. And he held them in his hands and he looked at me and he said, hey, Clint, you're not a problem. I think you're a drummer. moment on, I've never put those sticks down. I've toured, recorded, and played drums all over the world. My whole college education was paid for with drumsticks in my hand. Just because of a single moment in time when somebody believed in me, and he saw something in me that I didn't even see within myself. And from that moment, I learned that there's a difference between being the best in the world and being the best for the world. I love that. I have to confess, I've watched it about 10 times. In closing, I'd like to read again Acts chapter 11, verse 12, or 22. He, Barnabas, was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were brought to the Lord. Did you hear? Did you hear? Through Barnabas, the encourager, many people were brought to the Lord. May each of us be a Barnabas to our family, to our friends, and even those we do not know. Amen. And join us in our closing hymn. It is number 251 in your hymnal. We'll be singing verses 1 and 3 of Go Tell It on the Mountain. Before the benediction, Corey always reminds us to be living out bells. B meaning bless others. E meaning eat with someone this week that perhaps you wouldn't usually. Listen in your time of prayer, being quiet to what God would say. L, learn from the scriptures. And S, sent. 
considered your, yourself sent into the world. And I just want to say that if you encourage somebody this afternoon by expressing appreciation to them, you will be blessing them. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.